This is Daniel King, and you're listening to George Fox Talks Wellness. Hey, today we have Andy Mazuros, PhD, here to come and share with us about neuroscience. It's good to see you, Andy. Dan, good to be here. Thank you. So, I, you know, usually I introduce my guests, but today I kind of wanted to see if maybe you would kind of share your journey uh-huh. about how you got into uh, neuroscience and motor control and anatomy. Sure. Yep. So, I'm not sure how far back you want to go, but... Uh, I remember very specifically being a, a kid mm. and watching, uh, do you remember the Jerry Lewis telethons, right? Muscular oh, yeah. District yeah. telethons. And uh, we would always go in the neighborhood and raise money for Jerry's kids and MDA. And uh, there was a little vignette that they did um, where they went to uh, a, a laboratory in Cleveland that was studying functional electric stimulation. And they put stimulators uh, on kids that had muscular dystrophies, and they were showing how the stimulator would move uh, their limb. Mm. And I even get goosebumps now talking about it because it's so, it was so powerful to me, and it still is, that. Uh, that you could have a machine interface with a human doing something that's so totally natural, like moving. Mm. And uh, I, I sort of I dedicated myself, like, I have to do something with my life regarding movement. And um, uh, later on, I learned uh, that physical therapy was sort of the best way to really dive in deep when it came to movement and um, helping people... Uh, you know, rehabilitate from a, a movement-related problem. And uh, and then, you know, you just sort of keep hungry and you want to go deeper. So I got my PhD at the University of Iowa. Um, the degree's in exercise science, but it's, uh, it's really, its emphasis is in neuroscience mm-hmm. and uh, blending some biomechanics in with that. And uh, did a postdoc um, uh, at Iowa on the injury prevention a research center looking at uh, older folks and how they get injured, and um, and I'm here at George Fox with you, and uh, and that's sort of the the story. That's a great story. Yeah. So I see, I sense a, like you said, like you you sent. There seems to be a lot of passion around this, right? Yeah. And it sounds like that moment when you saw that uh, telethon, yeah, to do that was like life changing. Yeah. And I would say, you know, what particular did you, that seems to be so like interesting to you. Yeah. Um, I think at some level I sort of realized that because I was, I was an active kid, um, that like my greatest fear would be being in a wheelchair and a way to face that fear is to engage people who are in that position. Mm -hmm. And I think what captured me about the whole muscle stimulator thing was that a machine is trying to take over for what the nervous system would naturally do. And that was really my entry point into neuroscience. And what you quickly realize is like there there is nothing in science that we make, even though we have electric stimulators to help people try to walk, there are so many um, problems that come up when you try to drive muscle with a stimulator where like your body, your nervous system is so much better at controlling muscle than what any electric stimulator is. And part of what I did when I was a graduate student was to try to, I studied human fatigue in muscle and then tried to, to, to ask what can we do electrically to overcome that. And you just realize at a very deep level that, uh, <laughs> There's just nothing that even remotely comes close to doing what your nervous system can do when it comes to muscles and movement. And in in some ways, what you realize is that the nervous system cares less about muscles than more and more about things like um, 
uh, the, the mechanics of movement and the physics of what it takes to move segments of limbs. And, and that's why the area of neuroscience I'm, in, I'm so excited about because it, it's truly multidisciplinary and you've got to know about not just neuroscience and how the, the brain and spinal cord work, but also biomechanics. And there's an element of psychology in there. And certainly having the clinical background, you know, keeps it all grounded and relevant. Yeah. It, and, you know, I think you touched on something that's really important. I think that a lot of us don't really think about our nervous system very much. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it seems like that um, neuroscience is becoming much more popular now. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I was reading a leadership book and they were talking about neuroscience. Right? <laughs> yeah. I was talking about, I, I have three children and um, some of the parenting books I was looking at, they're talking about, you know, child development, right, mm -hmm. and neuroscience. Mm -hmm. So it seems like neuroscience is becoming, you know, much more popular in our culture. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know, like, as a scientist who does research around this, like, how do you feel about that? Yeah. Well, yeah, so neuroscience is the science of uh, studying how the brain and spinal cord um not just how they operate, but how they interface with organs and then ultimately mm. the rest of the world. And while it's exciting to see the interest in neuroscience, um, like I don't listen to neuroscience TED Talks uh, <laughs> anymore. And and what, what concerns me a little bit is that people are trying to leverage the mystery that's behind neuroscience in the blindness that the general public has about understanding how your body works, they're trying to leverage it for ulterior motives, and so that's that's a bit uh, disturbing uh, to me. But I think I think the power, the interest in neuroscience, is because um, it helps to explain why things are the way that they are. Mm -hmm. And I don't just mean like explain um, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or you know what happens after a stroke and all that's very important. But even even in your daily life, like why things are the way they are. So um, if um, like think of if, when your grandmother writes you a letter mm -hmm. and you notice like her handwriting looks sort of choppy mm -hmm. and sloppy, Right. There's a neuroscience explanation for that. Um, hmm. Or um, when you think about, uh, um, like when you bump your knee on something as you're walking, mm -hmm. and the first thing you want to do is rub it, mm -hmm. there's a neuroscience explanation for why we universally do that. Um, uh, so, so I mean, there's lots of other examples we can give. Uh, like one really amazing one is uh, like if you if you hold your finger out and you look at your finger and then you start turning your head, okay, your ability to keep your gaze on your finger. There's a neuroscience explanation for that. It's not like we have doll eyes where our 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 eyes are just floating in our head, right? It's that your the sensors that are that are looking at how your head moves are driving and reflexively controlling your eye muscles. So there's nothing that you have to do in order to have that to happen. It's all already sort of baked into you. And uh, one of the reasons I love being a physical therapist as well as a neuroscientist is that uh, like we have to help people retrain that reflex to keep their eyes stable on something mm -hmm. while their head and body move. So you're asking people to try to do something that they used to be able to do and no longer can do, but when they were able to do it, they didn't know how they were doing it. They just did it. And so that's a real that's a real challenge when you look at like walking. Um, your spinal cord is not just a dumb conduit mm. for signals coming down from your brain. In a, in a very real way, you have like little brains in your spinal cord. And the most important decisions about the way that you move are made by your spinal cord, not by your brain. So which muscles to activate, how to coordinate left and right limbs together, that's all done at the spinal cord level. So it, it's a good thing because it means you can walk and you can carry on a deep conversation and chew gum without falling over. Mm. Um, 
but it also means that when you have an injury and you can't walk anymore, like how do you retrain somebody to do something they, they could do, but they didn't know inside their body how they were doing it? And that's part of the real challenge of a, a physical therapist. So I rambled a little bit, but, but you can see like neuroscience has explanatory power for why the world is the way it is and why we, we perceive the world in its way. And, and I think that's very captivating to a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really captivating and you've said a lot, so many really cool things. And so I want to kind of recap maybe just some of those things that maybe you can give us an example for. You were talking a lot about the spinal cord, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people seem to be very focused on the brain. Mm -hmm. I would say it's a very, like right now the brain, there's a lot of brain focus, right? Yep. And I just wanted to know, like, if you could maybe give us an example or what you thought about that, the fact that, you know, we're really really focus on central nervous system and the brain and what the brain is doing yeah. and how we develop the brain. Yep. But you said that something about the spinal cord and maybe even some things about how it's baked into us. Like, mm -hmm. can you talk maybe about yeah. that? So um, there are a lot of people in, uh, I've, I've, my career has put me in touch with, uh, like I'm here at George Fox now. Um, but prior to coming here, I was at a, a, large state medical school. And I was the only person doing human neuroscience in a, with a group of people who were studying animals. Mm. And there are a lot of really smart people who drill down really deep looking at a very specific set of cells in the nervous system. Um, and we need people doing that for sure. But that work doesn't automatically translate to what's going, like, how does that fit in with the bigger picture? So I can give you an example. Um, um, think of a water molecule, right? You can spend your life studying under a microscope a water molecule, and you can know how it behaves and all that in that environment. But studying that at that level will never give you an explanation for why water can carve its way through a canyon in a certain way. Mm. It's water, mm. but it's water collected together. So what you see is that water takes on different properties depending on what level you choose to study it at. Okay. Right. So the same thing is true in neuroscience. Like we need people studying at the individual neuron level, but you also need people who are looking at systems level stuff. So the spinal cord, um, uh, uh, like I said, a lot of the most important decisions about movement are made at the spinal cord uh, level. And uh, um, I think even people in neuroscience forget about that. Um, there are... I don't know. Have you ever seen Futurama, uh, the, the cartoon show? I think I may have seen one episode. Oh, okay. So I like Futurama. Okay. 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 It's yeah. funny. Yeah. Um, but, but they have uh, heads in jars. Okay. Okay. Right. And they're, you know, Richard Nixon's head in a jar. Okay. Right, talking. Okay. Got it. Right. Um, we are never going to be heads in jars. <laughs> Okay, because your brain, if you think about a car, your brain is the CPU, right? The, right? the central processing unit chip in the car. Right. But the brain is not the car. Hmm. It serves a role. Sure. But the brain is not the car. And the same thing is, or, I'm sorry, the, the CPU is not the car. So your brain is the same. It serves a lot of hmm. important roles. But, um, and I, I think, I, I, I think people of faith in your audience will understand this where like there's a unity to the body that mm -hmm. is important as a scientist to recognize and it helps to guide the way that that you do your research at a level where you recognize that unity so i care very much as a scientist about how um, the spinal cord and the brain interact with each other mm. and um you know, over the years, when you see in popular media, when people talk about neuroscience, uh, I can remember some stories in the past about how, you know, people worried that they're going to hack into your brain mm -hmm. um, or that uh, if, if we could record signals, you know, EEG, it's called, if you can record signals from your scalp and look at what the, the surface of your brain, mm -hmm. how those cells are, are processing things, we'll be able to know what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. And I, I can assure you, reader, or your listeners, you can sleep well tonight because that day is not going to happen because mm -hmm. those cells serve 
a, a partial function. It's 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 not the whole. It's part of the whole. Mm. And this is where I think like a good solid education comes in mm -hmm. to help train you as a scientist. Where when you mix up the function of a part with the function of a whole. Um, you're going to you're going to run into problems and i do think in neuroscience there's going to come a day of reckoning where um you know we break things down in parts to make it manageable because it's so complex but we've also got to reunify things together mm -hmm. and i'm excited about some of the work in the brain where um you know i i, I just came over earlier today from uh taking some brains out of cadavers with some of our our uh our physical therapy students. Mm. And it's always, you know, it's an exciting moment. And, and we talk a lot about the anatomy and things that we can see. But if you really want to understand neuroscience, you, you can't just look at an anatomic view of the nervous system. It's important. Right. And it gives us good information. But anatomy has its limitations. Because what we know mm. now is that like you have networks in your brain and in your spinal cord that communicate with each other uh, for very short periods of time. But that communication is very important. And, and studying the anatomy doesn't give you insight into how these networks form and disappear. Mm. And so in neuroscience, to me, the exciting part is we need people at all levels. If you're interested more in the psychological part of neuroscience, mm -hmm. you can you can dive deep into that. If you're interested in poking neurons and studying them <laughs> in a microscope, do that. Mm -hmm. If you want to do imaging, right, where you're looking at brain signals, do that. But everybody benefits when each of us realize that like it's just one part of a piece of something much more complicated that we're looking at. And I rambled a little bit about the cord, but I, I want you to see like that having a sense of that there's unity in the body yeah. is a really important part of being a good neuroscientist. Yeah, no, I, I, I really appreciate that explanation actually, because when I'm practicing physical therapy too, one of the things that I try to do is see the whole person. You know, a lot of times we were, if you know, um, let's take just take the low back pain. Mm. You know, we're thinking maybe that's a, it's a disc herniation mm. and we can be so focused on that. Mm. So then we want to get imaging and all these other things and we get really focused on the disease. But we're not also, we, what we have to do then too is to look at how it affects the person, mm. right? And what I mean by that, it's like their movement or their function. And so many times my patient never complains about pain. Like, yeah, it's one of the ones, but it's usually what they cannot do. You know, like get on the floor with my kids, right? Mm -hmm. Or go to work, right? Mm -hmm. It's these functions. And I, I and it's it's kind of funny because for me, when you're talking about the neuroscience, you're trying to get a complete picture of something. Yeah. Not just about the CPU or not just about the spinal cord. But I think what's fascinating about, um, for me, about neuroscience is when I see people who've had like these things like spinal cord injury. And as a, you know, who doesn't love the inspiration, right, of someone who has a spinal cord injury and then trying to walk again, right? And I think about the spinal cord and I think about the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. And I think about, you know, um, like what you feel about that when you see those things and see that as kind of something inspiring or, you know, as a researcher, you know, what do you think about as you see, you know, someone who has that and maybe what the rehab's going to look like or, sure. or their story around that? Sure, sure. So... Right, everybody universally is is attracted to the the heroic story of somebody overcoming the odds, right, to yeah. get out of the wheelchair, and I'm still that way. Um, what people need to understand, though, is that well, I, I'll back up. Take a cat. This has been studied a mm -hmm. lot in 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 neuroscience. If you take a cat. This will sound gross to your your viewers, but but um, it's an important scientific point. Okay. If you take a cat and you cut a cat's spinal cord, and then you put the back legs of the cat on a treadmill, the cat will bear weight through their legs, and when you start the treadmill, mm. the cat will will have a certain you know kind of, of leg motion for walking, and then if you increase the speed, it will go to a trot and then go to a gallop. Wow. 
in, in what it shows you. Like, this is truly amazing. How does that happen? How can, how can the timing of the muscles mm-hmm. and the limbs be regulated by the input coming from the pads of the cat's feet? And it's all done purely at the spinal cord level, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that shows you the power of what the spinal cord can do in terms of processing. Now, let's take that to humans. If you take a human and, and you have a human spinal cord cut and you put them on a treadmill, okay, their legs do not automatically do that. Mm. You increase the speed, like you don't bear weight usually very well through, uh, through the legs at all once you have a spinal cord injury. So it shows you that there are things that we can learn in, in, uh, in animals and in, in nature about the nervous system is very important, but not everything's transferable to humans. Mm. Now there's a lot of interesting work being done to, s- to say, okay, can we do things like support people who are paralyzed in a harness system and lower them down partial weight bearing on a treadmill and then see if we can get motion going that way. And it's interesting work. Um, and I think this is probably too in other areas of science. Like you want people to support the work that you're doing and you're trying to make progress as a scientist, mm. but you do run the risk of sounding like every year, like we're this close to curing cancer or we're this close to curing paralysis mm-hmm. if you would just send us another $20, okay? Sure. So so we have to be careful on, on that. Um, and I do really object to when people try to take situations like someone being in a wheelchair and paralyzed and try to leverage that for some other ulterior motive. That, that makes me bristle, and I'm thinking of politicians in particular with that kind of thing. Um, so there's good progress being made, but, but like people have to, um, y- you have to understand that not everything that you see outside of being a human being is directly transferable to being a human being. And it's because even though a lot of the decisions about how we control our legs are made at the spinal cord level, the the driver that sets the pace for the neurons that control those muscles is higher up. Mm. It's above where a cat is. So when you cut it in a human, you've disconnected some of that driver. Got it. If that makes, yep, makes if sense. That, if that makes sense. So uh, that's why we're not as far as we'd like to be in getting people out of uh, out of wheelchairs. We're, we're more, what a scientist would say is we're more encephalized. We have, um, you know, cats are great. You can, you can drop them from a height and it's amazing that they can absorb that load and go on. Humans being more encephalized, like we've got more, we need brain cells to make computations and mm. to write poetry and and it means we're not as good at at uh falling from you know a, a seven foot height and being able to land uninjured and run away so that's cool man yeah. i like that yeah now, the other thing i wanted to ask you as i was listening to you was um a question about um stimulus and a question about um training I know one of the things that I hear a lot from just people who I talk to, um, especially in the world that we live in, in in rehab, is they always want a training program. And they always want something like a stimulus to help them retrain things, right? And I can think of a few things that I can maybe, uh, you know, throw your way. But Mm. I've always been really interested in a neuroscientist standpoint, Mm because from an exercise physiology standpoint, you know, I think what, you know, we always talk about is like dosing, right? The amount of exercise. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had a podcast about that and super interesting, good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to know what you thought about that. Like, you know, training and, yeah. you know, adaptations and rehabilitation. If someone was trying to change a behavior or do something, right? Yeah. And you notice from your standpoint, from your training, like, how do you see that, right? Yeah, yeah no. Um I don't care what kind of training program you're on. When you start some new training program, if your goal is to, uh, if you want to increase your strength, right? You want to have big cross section, big muscles, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The first six weeks of any training program 
any increase in strength that you see is not because you're packing more protein into the muscle. Mm. It hasn't even started yet. That that increase in strength is purely a neural process. So it's refining how the neurons in your cord control the muscle. It's refining the pathways from your brain down to the spinal cord and how they're ultimately controlling muscle. Six weeks, right? That's a long time to, when you start, like a lot of people drop their training program by six weeks because, you know, they sort of, they, they sort of fizzle out. Now you'll say, gee, yeah, but I, when I work out, I work out hard and my muscle looks bigger. And well, that's been really shown. Those are all changes in things like blood flow and right. the amount of extracellular fluid that you have and things like that. But but if you feel stronger, it's all just inside your nervous system. So um, uh, as a physical therapist, that's important because you know we may get to see somebody three or four times and hopefully we get an improvement in the way that they move. Um, but really at the most fundamental level, it's a change in the nervous system that we're enacting and not so much a change in like muscle tissue itself. So are you saying that when you go into a strength training program for about six weeks, mm-hmm. that, and you know, I'm gonna use layman's terms, mm-hmm. that you are like refining or you're reconnecting something that is becoming a perception of of strength, of yeah. coordination. Yep. Yeah. So, so yeah, it, uh, coordination is is a is a good word here. It's it's you're refining how your nervous system is controlling the muscle, um, both at the spinal cord level and and with your with your brain. The after six weeks, then the machinery is in place to actually start packing more protein into your muscles, and and then you're stronger. That is a uh, contribution, um, and then you can get you know per- more permanent, big and bulky. But um, uh, yeah, isn't that amazing? It's it's all it's all nervous system and and just refinement at that level. That's that's interesting. Yeah. How, do you know? So you said that you weren't that interested in exercise in the sense of like just starting something. But is there like um, is there something that you can think of like time wise? Like how much time do you think is optimal for someone to make sure that kind of like that connection or that coordination occurs when someone's exercising? Has that been studied from like a, from your standpoint on like how much exercise can you go before maybe you get fatigued or what's most optimal? Mm-hmm. Right. Because, I mean, if it's a nervous system thing, I want to that's different than cardiovascular. Right. I mean, what we're talking about. Right. Mm-hmm. Cardiovascular. We know some research around that. But I just wanted to know from a nervous standpoint, like what would be a good duration of time and how often should we be doing that to kind of help with that coordination? Um, I'll just say as a general rule, we probably underdose. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we're capable of doing more. Um, There's there's the old saying that the the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I think it's probably more often the other way around. The flesh is willing. But it's the spirit that's weak. So I'm not I'm not advocating for overtraining. Mm-hmm. But your body, um, there's a principle called anti fragility, okay. which is the idea that um, uh, you know the opposite of being fragile is not being robust. Mm. The opposite of being fragile is that you can take a stress. And you you need that stress in order to be able to improve. Like you actually improve as you expose yourself to stress. Mm. So it's a very different right idea. If if you're not stressing the system, like the whole use it or lose it sort of thing, mm-hmm. that is absolutely the case. And it's not just for like building muscle. It also has to do like with your inner ear. Um, I try to make a point every year to go to. Uh, I happen to live near one of the best roller coaster parks in the country, mm. and I go at least once, uh, especially as I get older, because that extreme, those extreme moments of stress, are helping my my inner ear, my sense of balance, maintain themselves so that they don't start to degrade. And now I get more sensitive in being like motion sick or something like that. So so 
I, I don't have a formula for you for working out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I'll just say like getting enough dosage, enough stress is important. And it's, it's very interesting when you look in the nervous system, like where do these improvements occur? Mm -hmm. And it really is very training specific. If you're doing strength training, the mm -hmm. changes in the nervous system are going to be different than if you're doing skill training, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm trying to teach my daughter how to drive a manual transmission now. Mm -hmm. And so where her, what we call it neuroplasticity, right? Where the changes in her nervous system are occurring are gonna be different than if uh, you know, you're know you weight training, um, so. so. You hit a buzzword. Oh, neuroplasticity. Yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah, you know, like if I read this book, I'm going to get neuroplasticity, right? <laughs> <laughs> By sipping this cup or whatever, you know, I'm going to get neuroplasticity. So, yeah. what is your definition of neuroplasticity? Because everyone, it seems like anything that makes you learn mm -hmm. is neuroplasticity. It is. It is. It when when you go to if 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 we could take uh, an electrode and we could map out on the on the surface of your brain mm. uh, how big how many cells are representing certain parts of your body okay that's that's a, a, a it's called the homunculus it's a map a body map that you have right. in, on your over your brain that's going to be a little bit different tonight when you go to sleep than it was when you got up this morning mm. and there's been work done where you know if you if if you have an amputation of a limb and you you look at how the map changes i mean within hours your 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 cortical map is changing how it represents things mm. so the brain is is an extraordinarily dynamic tissue mm. um but it's just like your muscle is an extraordinarily dynamic tissue and your bone right your bone we talked about anti-fragility. Bones will reform themselves based on the stressors or the lack of stressors that you put on it. Mm. So neuroplasticity is, it's its everywhere and it's true. But again, it's, it's one of those things where in popular culture, you got to be careful that you're not sort of being a sucker um, for... If people tell you, if you do this, you'll get neuroplasticity, well, you could go out and... Uh, learn how to crochet for a few hours in a day, and and you'll you'll have a neuroplastic change. Yeah. Right? It's uh, the 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 change is perpetual in it's part of the the human experience. And um, yeah, yeah, you know, you said that you go to this roller coaster, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think you're nuts to do, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> I don't like roller coasters. No, man. man, I don't like really? roller coasters. No, my driving is enough of a roller coaster for me. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I've seen you drive, so yeah. I I don't know. Yeah, so but you're talking about stress. Yeah. And it seems like when we're young, we we're more um risk taking. Yes. Right? Like we're jumping, we're climbing trees. Um I remember playing this game where I would just jump from one like one rock to another, right? Mm -hmm. And I, the further I can go, mm -hmm. the happier I was, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't afraid. But now as we get older, right? We stop taking those risks. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think one of the things I see going away really quickly is actually balance. Mm. Like I noticed that my balance isn't as good as when I was 12 or 13 when I was doing all these activities. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to ask, like, is that what you mean by like stressing our body? Like yep. maybe I should do more things that makes me take more risks or, you know, stresses my body in a way that would challenge my balance. Yeah. So it is true that as you get older, the ability, the plast, the plasticity, the ability to change starts to degrade. Got it. Um, you, you know, from in therapy, you can have kids who have certain problems, and they can literally take half of the the cortex out. And these kids, within a relatively short time period, their brain will create new connections mm -hmm. and they can do amazingly well. If you did the same thing to someone who's 30, it would be a very different outcome. So there is a, the, the, the amount of change you can have is a function of age. But that said, you've got to ask yourself if like the balance reduction is just because you haven't stressed that system and you may be, you know, surprised that 
that will come back to you mm-hmm. and you will adapt and and do better at it. And I think that's one of the things you, what's amazing about what you do in the clinic, Dan, is that you've got people who uh, had an injury, they went through a period of not moving. Mm-hmm. And part of what you're doing is like you're, you're dealing with the secondary things that come as a result of not moving, mm-hmm. pain, tightness, et cetera. And when you screen them out and give them permission to move, mm-hmm. you can start to see some gains coming back quicker. Mm-hmm. And, and that's something that gets lost a lot in medicine. Um, like not moving generates disease processes that uh, are not age-related, but uh, lack of movement related. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's a cultural issue. Mm. You know, this, this uh, anti-movement, like motion, right? Or this, des- or this desire to be safe versus trying to yeah. push, you know, these, um, I want to say perspective, but like pushing ourselves, Yeah, right? It's like kind of staying in our zone versus like trying to see what else is there. And doing your due diligence through that, right? I think more and more research is showing that, especially in the first world, right? Uh, in modern world, uh, we we're not stressing our bodies enough in that way. There's a push now with people who are middle aged and older to um, to do events that involve heavy loading, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or things that really stress the nervous system, working on speed-related things. Mm-hmm. One of the interesting things about aging in the nervous system is that when you when you hit about age 65, mm-hmm. each nervous system cell that you have that's controlling a group of muscle fibers, there's a reorganization where now each cell will be responsible for a larger number of muscle fibers. And in the end, it explains why you have trouble if you're trying to thread a needle mm-hmm. and you're, you know, 70 and, and you're having trouble controlling it, mm-hmm. that's the explanation. And and the research really shows that if you're doing um if you're stressing your nervous system in your 50s and 60s, you can push that when those changes occur, you can push them down the road. You can't avoid them, right. but you can push them down the road. And uh, I think I think the point you're making is uh, is a good one. And in addition, I, I, I want to uh, just switch gears a sure, little bit, just sure. not just about stress, but the nervous system. Um, like one of its main functions people don't think about sometimes is its ability to predict the future of what's going to happen. Mm. So for example, if if I were to if I were to ask people right now, like if you're if you're standing up, yep. like lift your arm up in front of you. Mm-hmm. And you could ask the question, well, what muscles are turning on first when you go to lift your arm up in front of you while you're standing? And the answer is not the muscles in your shoulder. The answer actually is the muscles in the back of your legs Hmm. and down into your feet. Hmm. Because as you go to lift your arm out in front of you, you're shifting your your weight, your mass forward. Like think of if you lifted your arm with a really heavy weight, Mm -hmm. you would fall forward. Right. Well, the same is true even if if it's not weighted. So what your nervous system does is at just the right time, and in just the right amount, it will activate your foot muscles or the muscles in the back of your leg or your mm. back, and it will it will contract them first before it allows your arm to move. Mm. So again, this is isn't amazing. It's it's baked into your nervous system. No one had to teach you this. Mm. Okay. But when it doesn't work, it explains why someone can't stand and use their hands. Mm. It's not a, it, 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 it may not be a hand problem. Right. It actually may be a back and leg muscle problem, and those things aren't turning on before you go to move your hands. Yeah, so, so interesting. So what are some of the best exercises you can think of for the nervous system? Because you use, you, and, and I know this, this might be, you know, it's yeah. hard to pinpoint sometimes, yeah. right? But I, I've, I've heard you say, you know, that stresses the nervous system, and those kind of language. And I think there's some people here and some of our great you know, listeners and viewers who are 
probably wondering that, like, what could I do, right, to stress the nervous system so that I can delay or push back? Mm -hmm. And we've seen that a lot, right? We see that in athletes who are doing things much later on in their lives, like 50s, 60s, and 70s, who are pushing that back, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what are some of the things that you can think of that might be helpful for, and I know it's so, I mean, you, it's so general, but we can get real specific too, right? Yeah. But within your, so, within your yeah, so, so expertise. I, 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 I can't probably say a specific exercise, but I'll give a principle. And the principle is power, okay? Power is, it's your ability to generate force hmm. in a certain time period. Okay. Okay. It doesn't have to be a lot of force, but it's force in a certain time period. And so when we study things like, you know, what's the neural basis for why people fall? And a lot of people who fall, fall not because they're not strong enough, but it's because they don't have power. They can't generate enough muscle force in a rapid time period. And so what I would say to folks is, you know, if you're, if you're in your... Uh, mid 30s and forward you should be focusing on exercises that where you have to generate power a certain amount of force in a more rapid time period now it does expose you to injury and sometimes you know you'll get people who are going to always err on the more conservative side and say I don't want to be injured and I understand and mm -hmm. respect that but like we've said right anti-fragility you don't get the benefits if you don't expose yourself to the stress and uh um, like now me middle-aged guy um you know i'm i'm trying to do more when it comes to power related stuff and yeah it may mean that sometimes i'm sore um or going on like the roller coasters yeah it does mean like the first time that I go on it uh, after being away for a while, I do feel a little mm -hmm. bit wobbly mm -hmm. afterwards. And you know, you lay in bed at night and I can feel every hill and ride and relive it. But then if I go again in a month, that gets better. Mm. So if you wanna if you wanna get a gain, you've got to expose yourself to a bit more risk. And I think power is uh, is what I would just generally yeah. um, suggest to to folks i like that a lot actually yeah. what's your what's your um what's your opinion about like hit exercises then like high incident like high intensity training because that's a huge craze right now right and i again you know well, I'm, a, I'm at first pass that to you what do you think of it well i would say that you know i think that hit is great i think the problem is is the fact that it's become one of those things where it's a um it solves all the world's problems yeah Right, and I don't think that's true. I think some people actually need to do cardiovascular exercises, if that's their you know main focus. And because I work with people who've had heart attacks and these other injuries, like I don't think hit it might be the best thing to do in the beginning, because it stresses the body in a different way than doing like a moderate aerobic exercise. And I mm -hmm. think it all depends. But I think there should be a point, especially if you have like congestive heart failure. We know that there's some atrophy that occurs with that because they're not pushing themselves that hard. Mm -hmm. We do like a 60 second high intensity training to try to build power to help them with sit to stands, hmm. like from just getting up and then standing, you know, and, you know, that's one of those things that they start complaining a lot of, of losing their power hmm. is getting up and out of a chair. Hmm. And so those are things that I focus on. But so I, I actually want to play off of something you said when you mentioned congestive heart failure. Yeah. Um, there are... Um, there are sensors in muscle that sense the pH of muscle, which is how acidic or basic yeah, yeah. a muscle yep. is. And it's been mapped out like, like when people have cardiovascular problems, yep. those sensors have the ability to try to shut down and inhibit you from being able to move your extremities very well. Mm. So it's it's we talked about plasticity, yep. right? In in science we call this maladaptive plasticity. Yeah. So it's it's an adaptation, it's a compensation and it makes sense like yeah. your body's trying to limit your stress on the heart by not allowing you to move. Right. But there also does come a point where like if you put in um uh uh, if you have a cardiovascular procedure and you yep. improve the blood flow to the heart, yep. now what you have to do is turn off that 
maladaptive plastic change. And so you know this, right, very intimately that some of the weakness those cardiac patients have is it's their nervous system trying to limit their function. And now you've got to decide, do we push on through this or not? Right. And I think that's one of the interesting aspects of COVID where um, some people in the post-COVID stage do not push themselves to try to recover their lung function and it lingers and then it turns into some other secondary things. So part of like working with a physical therapist is like you is knowing when can I push myself, not just when can I push myself to get back, but when should I push myself to get back? Yeah. So. You know, I think that's such an important part is understanding the physiology behind that. Mm. You know, and I think even understanding the pathophysiology, right? And I think that a lot of times we try to dummy that down. And I, I'm really glad in this conversation we didn't do that. Mm. I feel like we did a really good job in trying to talk it through and really talk about some really good general science points in neuroscience. Mm. And, and, you know, I think the challenge always is, is when something gets popular, that it's just too simple. Mm. Right. Like, like I hear literally like that's really why I wanted you to come on, because um, I just hear neuroscience and everything. And I just I feel like it's just so it's, simple. Right. It's good. But I want people to to be a bit skeptical. OK. Right. Yeah. Um, there there's uh, uh, a lot of your audience is Christian. Yeah. I assume. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. So a lot of times, um, like, let's think of the concept of dualism. Right. Dualism is the idea that. Uh, there are material things that exist in the universe, but then there are also immaterial things, right? And a lot of times, faith-based people will think of the immaterial mm -hmm. as well. And scientists will point at that and say, you know, that's dualism, that's, you know, how can you believe in immaterial things? Mm -hmm. I'm in a purely objective science, I only believe in objective material things. Sure. Okay. But scientists, I'm giving you the inside scoop here, Dan. Yeah. Okay. Give me the scoop, man. Scientists oftentimes engage in a different kind of dualism, mm. especially neuroscientists, okay. where they see the brain and then they see the rest of the body. Mm. And, and uh, they will talk about the brain, like, like they'll personify the brain. Yeah. And I understand why people do it because it's so complex. Like you have to speak in terms that that we use in normal discourse to, to we'll say like, well, these cells understand this piece of information. Yeah, yeah. But again, like we have to go back to that part whole relationship. Scientists often engage in their own form of dualism. Brain is separate from the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I want to make sure I leave your listeners with yeah. is is embrace the idea of unity. The body is, the brain is part of the body. It needs the body. It can't survive without the body. Mm -hmm. um, it's a part. It's not the whole. And and I think good neuroscientists uh, like care about not just function in certain cells, but behavior. Yeah. And and looking at the totality of things, and. Um, I think that's something that gets lost a lot in in modern discourse about neuroscience, and I appreciate your uh, bringing that up and the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah, because I, I want to. I think the thing is, is that I want to know the whole story. Yeah, you know, and I think again, we've spent only just a you know a few minutes together today, but I just feel like we're giving people a, maybe a uh, a bigger picture of mm -hmm. what this all looks like, and. I just wanted to ask you, you've brought it up a few times and mm. you've brought up faith and mm. science. And mm. I don't really know anybody actually more involved in science than you. Mm. Really, I don't. But I also wanted to ask you about your faith component and how you, you know, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, no. That, and how, well, how, and how, how, how does like, that inspire you or, you yeah. know, as a scientist and your faith component, yep. uh, if you can share that. So, in, so the scientific method is a way, it's a very powerful way to look at the world to try to explain things. But I think good scientists recognize the limits of it. You know, if you really want to talk about the dynamics of love, mm. you, you can't use the scientific method to do it. Right, right. 
And it's unfortunate, and I think you see it a lot today, that there are scientists, bureaucratic scientists, mm -hmm. who think that they represent science. If you go against what I say, you go against science. Sure. And that, to me, is the red flag, like, you're not the real deal, because no real scientist would would talk like that. Right. It's about open debate and discussion. So, so the scientific method is a truly powerful way to look. It's a lens. Like mm. I think in lenses. Yeah. It's a lens to look at the world. But faith is another lens to look at the world to get a different kind of knowledge about the world. Mm. And it is true knowledge, right? Yeah. You think of scientists like you do an experiment and it's purely objective, but really the basis for the experiment is a hunch, right? I've got, I, I think mm -hmm. this is gonna happen, right. and I've got some reason to believe it, but my knowledge is partial, it's mm -hmm. not whole. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like faith, faith is that too. Faith is not blind, faith has a knowledge component to it, mm. right? And so if if you fall in love with someone yeah. and you start to get information about them and you think maybe we should get married, right? You, you have partial knowledge, but you're going to still act on that partial knowledge. That's acting on faith. It doesn't mean you act blindly. I think we have to redefine what we mean by faith. Mm -hmm. There's knowledge behind faith. Mm -hmm. You strengthen your faith by strengthening your knowledge. Amen. So the same thing, relationship with God, mm -hmm. right? People who say, oh, I have no faith. Well, it's because you have no knowledge. Mm -hmm. you, like get, you get knowledge, and then the faith will start, and then you can act on that knowledge, and then you'll get more information that will help refine and strengthen your faith. But really the process is, is the exact same in science mm -hmm. um, in terms of moving on partial knowledge and trying to look at things objectively, uh, but it's a different lens. And I, I think there's a reason why, at least in, in, in the Western world, universities came out of the heart of the church and mm -hmm. it's because you know think of think of some of the great discoveries in science yeah. that actually came from monks mm -hmm. right gregor mendel mm -hmm. in genetics mm -hmm. um the big bang theory mm -hmm. that was a french priest who was an academic who, who developed that mm. So I think that this whole idea that faith and science are opposed to each other is a canard. It's just for people who, who I think in, in the end, don't really understand either. Yeah. It's a different agenda. And um, you know, I, I'll say this, if you're a Christian and you're interested in science or neuroscience, do not be afraid. Mm. Be inspired by what you see when, 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 when I saw those kids being able to move yeah. with that electric stimulator, yep. it sparked something really deep in me yep. that I think came through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so when you have that, you should not reject science. Uh, like, it, I have to either choose God or choose science. That is, that is to me, that's straight from the devil, right? That's a yep. false dichotomy. Yep. You pursue the science. You you can represent your faith in in the scientific community, and uh, um, it, it does come back to that whole notion of unity. Yeah. That there's a unity to the universe that we live in, and uh, um, yeah, yeah. I, I so appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah. You know, I've I kind of have the same experience as you know about the complexity of pain. Yes. You know, when I start, started to see things that didn't make sense around pain, hmm. it actually didn't make my faith waver. As I started to really study pain hmm. and go deeper into the knowledge and understanding of pain, it actually made my faith become stronger hmm. because I saw components of what you were talking about. You know, I saw these components that that not knowing doesn't mean that I'm dumb or whatever, right? Like not knowing means that I got to get more knowledge and understanding mm -hmm. and that it's worth giving up lots of things to try to figure out. And what I'm concerned about and what I and I think I'm so grateful to teach is to encourage people to not be afraid. Yeah. But to pursue. Amen. Deeply. 
Amen. And that's what I hear from you as well, too. It's like we our topic area might be just a tad bit different, but I think our pursuit is the same. Yeah. And I think our faith is deepened by that. Yeah. yeah. And 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 I think to to take that route, like there has to be to be successful in taking that route, you have to have an, uh, a sense of patience. So if you're studying something scientific mm -hmm. and you find something and it seems to contradict your faith, right? So you have to look at that and and say, okay, I may have I have incomplete knowledge here. Do I need, uh, you know, is is this something where I have to dive? I'm going to dive deeper in the science to understand this, or maybe there's some aspect of my faith, right? Because you can be wrong in how you understand right. your faith. Right. Maybe that needs to be refined. Mm. But in the end, in this universe, right, there's there can't be a conflict between scientific knowledge and faith knowledge. Mm. If God is who he claims to be, yep. Right, as the creator of this, what kind of God would would create a universe where you're giving a head fake if you study the the mechanisms of the universe mm -hmm. and it contradicts your faith? Mm. Like that can't be right. Right. So um, you got to have patience, though, if you want to if you want to go down there. And I know that that's something with your patience that you work with, uh, or with your patience in your patience. Right, is right. something that you sometimes have to really work on with them, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I would say that that's so true. You know, I think that deep work and that patience in science is something that we, um, I think we delight in it. But I'm hoping that this discussion will help people also delight in going deeper. Mm. That's really kind of what I got today um, in sharing the space and time with you. Yeah. There's a lots of, um, I think, gold nuggets here. But for me, um, you're right I, that there is such a um, such a deepness in what we're doing, and the pursuit is well worth it. Yeah. And when um, <clears throat> when we took the the kid, the brains out of the bodies mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're working on the technical knowledge of things, but we're also like, I'll take the brain and I'll have a student hold it, <laughs> and, and, and I'll say to them. Like, think about what's in your hands right now. Because for me, I mean, if you've ever been backpacking and you see the Milky Way in the night sky, like it gives you goosebumps and you you stand at awe, not just the beauty, yeah. but like where where am I as a human being in this vast universe that God has created? Right. Right. And and you can take any supernova or whatever you want in science and put it up against that lump of tissue that you're holding in your hands there. Mm. And I don't think that there's anything in all of creation that is more complex. Like it's not the person, the brain is not the person, but that tissue at one point in that person's life uh, mediated their, the first kiss that they have or the memories of their child being born, mm. or it helped to coordinate their, um, their golf swing or you know whatever right? Right. right but that that is part of the body that primarily mediated that and you're holding it and it really is true like you know you say the more you you know the more you don't know yeah um it's really true when it comes to neuroscience and that's part of the the um that's part of what drives you yeah um but also it's part of the the beauty and the humility, right? Yeah. You approach it with great humility. Yeah. And and uh like you should you should look at upon your body and like little simple things that you are able to do. Like mm -hmm. I mentioned at the start, you can look at your finger and turn your head mm -hmm. and your eyes are automatically fixated on that right. point. Right. You should look at that in awe. Mm -hmm and wonder, and how do I do that? I don't even know how I do that. Mm -hmm. We can explain it, but it just happens. Yeah. And uh, that should deepen your faith. I agree. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for this conversation. It definitely has deepened my faith, and I think it's also helped me understand a bit more about the neuroscience. And I think we've given some really great practical theories and ideas of how to help somebody who's thinking about it. And I think the thing that I've really appreciated the most is really 
your expertise, but also your transparency with that and how faith is all encompassing for the work that you're doing. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dan. I, I mean, I don't know, your listeners should know that like you are the tip of the spear mm -hmm. for what we're doing in physical therapy. And I have seen you transform the lives of people in profound ways through your knowledge of neuroscience and exercise physiology. And, and I hope that as listeners, consider universities or what career they want to be in, um, that they'll see your work ethic and your faith, and, uh, and it'll be an inspiration to them to make a difference in the world. So thank you, Dan. I really appreciate that. And it's a, it's a pleasure speaking with you today and working with you as well, too. All right. This has been a production of George Fox Digital. If you like what you're hearing, subscribe to George Fox Talks on Apple, Spotify, or whatever you're streaming on. Check us out on the web at georgefox.edu slash talks, where we have videos, publications, and more. And we're also on YouTube at youtube.com slash georgefoxtalks.